Okay, so the final lecture is going to talk about some things like top down control and food webs. So we know that grazers can limit the growth of primary producers and this would be called top down control. Predators can limit the biomass of lower trophic levels. So this shark is eating fish and then fewer fish might be around to eat the small fish, right? So we're going to talk about two things, top down versus bottom up effects in ecosystems. So both, you know, increasing production from the bottom up can change things and increasing predators from the top down can change things. But they, um, how they influence an ecosystem will depend on things like time, place, environmental circumstances. And top down and bottom up influences, although they sound kind of similar, have vastly different outcomes. So I'm going to talk about bottom up first. So say you increase primary producers. Well, that's going to lead to an increase in the number of primary consumers they can support and then increase in secondary consumers and an increase in tertiary consumers. So all of those things are going to increase and that's called propagation. So everything goes up from the bottom. Now it's very different from if you have an increase in the tertiary consumer. Say you have a really great, you know, year for wolf puppies and so you have a ton of top predators. That is going to actually cause a decrease in their prey item because there's so many predators that are going to apply pressure on the prey population, it's going to go down. So an increase at the top leads to a decrease at the level below. And because those guys are going down, then they release pressure on the primary consumers and they go up. And then that causes the primary producers to go down. So this is why it's called a trophic cascade is that it's not a straight up and down effect that you actually get these arrows flip flopping as you move down down the trophic levels. Okay, so this is what a trophic cascade is. And top down controls can lead to flip flops. So say you have an increase in otter or you have otter density naturally, and then the otter are hunted to zero. Well, then urchins where you have natural um, densities of urchins, um, urchins are going to go up where the otter have been hunted out because there's no one to prey on them. And then the algae where there's lots of urchins, then the algae will go down. So you get these really dramatic flip-flops in systems with trophic cascades. So here's a case study of wolves. So wolves prey on coyotes, but they also prey on elk and mule deer. The elk and mule deer then prey on riparian plants. Um, and so Here's a picture of Yosemite before wolves were reintroduced and after. So where there are no wolves, we have these ungulates just flagrantly, flagrantly browsing down by the river. Nobody's going to eat them. They don't care. They're eating off all of the riparian vegetation. They're eating up all of the aspens. Okay. You add wolves into the system and all of a sudden the ungulates run up into the hills. The aspen can regrow, the riparian vegetation can regrow, and all of those riparian species come back to the system. So the birds and the frogs and the beaver um, and the wolves, right, and the bears. And so this is a really cool example of how top predators can influence um, the diversity and dynamics of an ecosystem. And it can go one step further. So if you have wolves that increase um, predation on elk that then allow for riparian plants to grow, it can change the way that rivers flow across their landscapes. And so there's this really cool study um, showing how uh, elk have resulted in um, reduced riparian vegetation, which then changed the kind of channel structure of the rivers themselves. Okay, so some other ecosystem effects of trophic cascades. If you have low zooplankton grazing, that can lead to greater influx of CO2 to lakes. So more carbon can be taken up by those algae if the grazers aren't putting too much pressure on them. If you have large fish in a stream, you can actually decrease the amount of CO2 that's released from streams because there are fewer organisms preying on the detritus and the algae, and so less CO2 is emitted. Higher phytoplankton populations can decrease light penetration, right? You get these kind of algal blooms, or they can cause harmful algal blooms where toxins and kind of like they use up all the oxygen in the water and cause fish kills. Top down pressures can also influence the microbial loop, which is the brown food web. And so um, all of these things can influence um, these interactions that I've been talking about. 
Okay, a few more things. Um, a lot of aquatic organisms are indicators of stream integrity. So um, the invertebrates on the left are indicators of good water quality. The invertebrates on the right are indicators of poor water quality. So you can use the assemblages of communities and streams to tell something about the, the integrity of, of the system or of the, the polluted nature of the system. And then there's a few different kinds of organisms. I just want to make sure everybody's heard these terms before. So some species are unique or dominant. And so a keystone species, this is Robert Payne, um, kind of coined this term. Keystone species are species that are disproportionately um, influencing the rest of the community. They are often top predators, but not always. So we talked about sea otters and kelp forests. Sea stars are top predator. That was the organism that he worked with. He was a professor at the University of Washington. Prairie dogs can be considered keystone species, sapsuckers, and wolves. So a lot of these organisms are, are kind of influencing the rest of the community, um, providing habitat and shelter um, or, you know, not, not providing habitat and shelter, I take that back, but, but influencing the community. Um, here's a picture of Robert Payne's academic tree, and I just want you to know, since you're all studying with me, that if you zoom in right there, you see J. Marks. J. Marks, Jane Marks was my PhD supervisor, so technically this tree was drawn after I started, but if if we were to add me and you to this tree, this is where you would belong on Robert Payne's academic tree. All right, so um, other species are considered foundation species. They're species that actually provide the structure and the habitat for others. So a lot of these things are plants. So things like kelp, kelp forests, cottonwood trees and riparian forests or hemlocks in um, uh, regular forests, right? And um, the woolly adelgid is taking out hemlocks, and so we're losing that foundation species. Um, and then ecosystem engineers are organisms that alter or create habitat. So beaver are creating uh, wetland habitat, dam habitat. Galling insects create this little gall structure that other insects can live in. And Chinook salmon, through their building of reds, are are also creating habitat for, um, for other organisms. Okay, so hopefully that was helpful and interesting. See you next time.